All righty. Good afternoon. It's 12.01, so I can say afternoon now. Um, I know most of you, but my name is Catherine Stoner. I'm a senior fellow here at um, the Freeman Spogley Institute and also the deputy director um, and um, also uh, one of the investigators on this uh, project, which is uh, Russian power and purpose in the 21st century, um, as our research scholar Alice Underwood has named it RPP21. Um, for the Silicon Valleyites back there. So um, it's my pleasure as part of this continuing um, series to introduce our speaker today, um, Professor Judy Twigg, who uh, has come to us from Virginia Commonwealth University, where uh, she is a professor of political science and teaches courses on global health, international political economy, international relations, and Russian politics. Um, she is also uh, senior associate non-resident with the Russia and Eurasia program at CSIS in Washington, DC. Um, she is a consultant to the World Bank and to the US government. Um, I should say that Judy is, I think, uh, quite unique in um, the field uh, of Russia watchers in that um, she is uh, very, very data driven. Um, and she knows a ton about the demography, health and human capital uh, of Russia. And it's a small, tightly knit community, I would mm -hmm. say, that, that knows things about this. Um, and um, I, uh, I've long admired and loved your work because uh, I think there's so much that is uh, surprising uh, that people don't know. There are, there are good news stories in Russia um, and there are some bad news stories. Um, but um, I know that this is going to be a really, really interesting um, talk. Judy's also, by the way, for those of you interested in Ukraine, um, has worked on uh, um, Ukrainian uh, demography and health crises, including their HIV AIDS uh, crisis as well. Okay, um, with that, Judy, take it away. I will slip around so I can see the, the slides a bit better. All right, thank you, Catherine. Thanks for the invitation. Um, thank you to Alice for the tremendously efficient and wonderful logistics of, of getting me here, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I will start with the bottom line up front, and that's that demographic decline and overall human capital issues in Russia um, are increasingly politically important to Russia. Um, they've been noted by top leaders, including Putin, um, for a long time, but the focus on these issues has escalated quite a bit recently. Demographic and health issues occupied about half of Putin's State of the Nation address a couple of weeks ago. Um, part of his big focus on family values, an extra $65 billion in spending, all intended to uh, do things like increase the birth rate and, uh, and try to turn around the demographic decline. Um, Putin and the leadership in the Kremlin have a strong interest in addressing these issues head on for a lot of reasons. Um, one is pension spending, and I'll go through these charts fairly quickly because they're intended to be just quick illustrations. Um, the ratio of working age people to the pension age population is bottoming out and will only decline over time. So having enough workers to support their pay-as-you-go pension system, long-term care are all uh, deeply important fiscal and social issues that Russia has to deal with. Conscription, the number of men available to draft by the Russian army um, in that 15 to 19 year old age cohort um, reached its uh, low trough a couple of years ago. It's bouncing back up again now, but it's never going to reach what it was um, a couple of decades ago. And we've already seen a couple of decades worth of military reform, changing the parameters of conscription and the draft, trying to professionalize the military service, all driven almost exclusively by these, uh, by these demographic challenges. Um, Russia also cares deeply about just what its population dynamics say about its status as a great power. So these questions matter for Russia in deep and fundamental ways. And my basic argument today is that the approach that they're taking to solving these questions, while it's had many positive features over the last decade or so, um, it has some unresolvable tensions. That their goals of creating systems that are efficient, that are modern, that offer world-class levels of service, um, those goals are fundamentally at odds with the parallel political and social interests that the Kremlin has in controlling society, in counter-positioning Russia as a great power to the West, in cementing Russia's identity as a deeply fundamentally conservative society, and in many ways closing Russia off from the Western world. 
So as a result, and this shouldn't be a surprise, um, Russia is a bundle of contradictions, but as a result, what we see are contradictory outcomes and many policy initiatives that actually create more problems than they solve. So with that as the bottom line, let me start just very briefly by underlining what the demographic challenge looks like. So this is the population of Russia over the last couple of decades, and you can see the deep decline in Russia's population until about a decade and a half to go, ago. Um, an impressive recovery since then, um, that one-time 4 million person increase back in 2014 is because they added Crimea to their official population <laughs> statistics. Um, but nonetheless, you can see until the last couple of years, and we'll talk about those last couple of years in a moment, um, this is a country that in terms of sheer population numbers was making some fairly steady progress toward reversing uh, previous losses. Life expectancy, again, took a dramatic hit back in the uh, in the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed, and it's more or less tracked with the state of the Russian economy over the last couple of decades, but has had some very impressive increases over the last decade or so. Here's another way of depicting the situation. For a long time, you had a dramatically larger number of deaths than births in the country, again, precipitated largely by the chaos and the collapse of the Soviet system. Um, those scissors began to cross um, seven or eight years ago, and you can see a roughly equal number of births and deaths through the 2012 through 2015-16 period. Um, and then you can see things kind of falling apart again over the last year or two. And again, we'll talk about those last couple of years in just a moment. But what all this leads to is a set of population forecasts. And these are the Russian government's population forecasts for the Russian population numbers over the next couple of decades. And you can see that the high variant, which no one thinks is going to happen, um, is the only one that projects a population increase. And the medium and low variants, and I think probably somewhere in between those two is, is what's most likely to happen, are pretty negative projections for what population numbers are likely to look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So why is this going to happen? Well, there's lots of reasons, but the one overwhelming cause is the number of children who weren't born back in the early and mid-1990s when society collapsed, when the country collapsed, and when people just stopped having children. And so those incredibly low birth rates, the incredibly low numbers of births back in the early 1990s, all of those girls who weren't born then now contribute to an age cohort of women at about the right point in their life to have children, there are dramatically fewer of those people now. So this is an unavoidable, baked in demographic echo of what happened back in the early and mid 1990s. They're not gonna have more babies because there just aren't enough women in the 20 to 35 year old age cohort to make that happen. Now, you could try to do what the Russian government is trying to do, and that is compensate by getting each woman that you have, each family that you have, to have more children. But overcoming the population loss by increasing the total fertility rate, which is the average number of children that a woman has during her lifetime, is an untenable proposition, not just in Russia, but in any advanced industrial society. In Russia, you'd have to get this number, the total fertility rate, up to three, 3.5 children per woman. And that's just not going to happen in a society where women have entered the workplace, uh, in a modern society. Um, no matter what the political and economic social conditions, it's very unlikely that you're going to get a TFR up to that number. So I just throw up on the screen here the total fertility rate um, over the last couple of decades, and you can see again that it plummeted back in the early 90s. They've steadily brought it up over time, and we'll talk a little bit about how they've done that in, in a few minutes. Um, but again, it's coming back down again over the last couple of years. And before we talk about those last couple of years, about the, the reversal that we've seen since 2016, 2017, let's ask one other question about population dynamics, and that's migration. Um, the total population of a country is determined not just by the number of people being born and the number of people dying, but the number of people moving in and out, in migration and out migration. And the most important point that I want to illustrate with this chart is that net migration into Russia has been positive over the entire post-Soviet period. In other words, there have always been more people coming in 
to Russia, then leaving Russia through migration. Um, this is only the official statistics. If you actually captured the millions of people who have come in through illegal and uncaptured labor migration, this number would be even more positive over most of the years that we're, that we're capturing here. So what we learned from this chart is that if not for significant immigration, Russia's population loss would have been even more severe than it already was over the last uh, couple of decades. Now, looking at what hap was happening in the last couple of years has to make the Kremlin panic because gains that they realized throughout the decade of the 2000s look like they may be starting to reverse under pressure of economic downturn and sanctions and counter sanctions. So this chart shows the components of population growth. And so just to um, unpack it a little bit for people who can't read the Russian, um, the darker bar is the natural population growth. That's the relationship between births and deaths. So you can see that was negative back in 2011. More people died than were being born. And then they accomplished something pretty impressive. They kicked that back up into positive numbers from 2012 through 2016. So that small positive of the darker bar is, is quite an imp impressive achievement for, for the Kremlin. And we'll talk a little bit about how they made that happen. But that has now gone backwards over the last couple of years. The consistently positive, lighter colored, lighter orange bar is migration, as we can see, always positive. And then that leads to the red line, which is just the sum of those two, the general population growth over the, uh, over the last decade. Um, so clearly something has happened over the last couple of years that is making the Kremlin even more apprehensive about what's happening with these, uh, with these demographic projections. So let's take a look for a few minutes at what the Russian government has done to try to fix this problem. There's a pretty long list of policy innovation coming out of the Kremlin in the last 10 or 15 years, and actually even predating that. And much of it is pretty impressive. Much of it tracks with international best practice. Much of it has been enforced in meaningful ways. And so giving credit where credit is due, there's been quite a bit of impressive policy coming out of the Russian government. Um, going back to 2000, or excuse me, 1991, um, before the Soviet Union collapsed and then solidified into Russian Federation law in 1993 is a system of compulsory health insurance. Um, everyone is covered with a basic level of, uh, of both primary and tertiary health care. Um, lots of issues around that that we'll talk about in a few minutes, but basically this has been an earmarked pool of money for health care that meant that the health care sector would have collapsed even more than it actually did, if not for this chunk of funds that was set aside for mandatory health insurance back in the early 1990s. Then fast forward to the mid 2000s when Russia actually climbed out of its economic hole when it started to have some oil and gas money to play around with. It had budget surpluses and they poured some of that into health, demographic and social issues. So back in 2006, we saw the beginning of Medvedev's priority national projects. Um, that was new money, quite a lot of it that went into education, agriculture, housing and health. Um, those were the four projects. Um, health got about half of the money um, and they did a lot of impressive things with that money. Um, they focused on construction of a couple of dozen high-tech medical centers all around the country, not just in Moscow and St. Petersburg, mostly focused on treatment of cardiovascular disease, which is the number one cause of mortality in Russia, and maternal and child health, uh, because they were concerned about infant mortality and about saving uh, babies in trouble, about neonatal resuscitation. Um, they were smart on emergency care. They revamped the ambulance fleet all around the country. They built emergency medical centers near the places where they were having the highest mortality from traffic accidents. So again, you know, smart technology-based, GPS-based uh, policy. They increased salaries for primary health care workers, for, for family practice, general health care doctors, very important. This all had some impact back in the late 2000s. Not a lot of public perception that a lot had changed, but it did move the needle on their health care outcomes a little bit. And then fast forward just a little bit more to the May decrees that President Putin put forward at the uh, beginnings of his presidencies in 2012 and 2018. Um, and these were new because of the sheer amount of money 
new money that got poured into these issues, and also because of target setting. This was something relatively new, and these uh, May decrees didn't just set targets for health and demographic issues, they set targets for everything. Um, and we can talk about what it means and what incentives it creates to set particular targets for particular things, but target setting is an important exercise. It gives goals at the national level that then trickle down to the regional level and, and the rayon, the, the local levels. Um, so these were important goals that cascaded out through the entire, uh, entire health and, uh, and social system. And, and these, were the, uh, these were the 2018 targets. They went after non-communicable disease in a big way. Um, Catherine can tell us a lot about what's happened with tobacco policy. Um, a similar set of measures have been in place for alcohol. Um, again, international best practice, increased taxes, um, which increased prices, uh, restrictions on advertising, on points of sale. So the 24-hour kiosks where we could go get booze and cigarettes 24 hours a day, those are gone now. There are restrictions on the hours and the locations that you can sell alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, they put seatbelt laws in place and actually started to enforce them in, in a meaningful way. Um, this is very good pu public policy that was enacted. Um, they also put in place pronatal policy to deal with the declining birth rates. So these started in the late 2000s with a lump sum payment to families on the birth of their second and then subsequent children. So this is designed to get women to have more than one baby. Um, a payment that started at the equivalent of around $12,000, but with ruble devaluation, it went down to about 7,000. Um, payable on the child's third birthday and could be used for education of the child, housing for the family, or one of the parents' pensions. Um, all the studies that we've done on those say that they didn't actually do very much to encourage Russian women to have more children. I mean, kids are way more expensive than $10,000. Although there is some evidence that in rural areas, in remote rural areas, that $10,000 actually did make enough of a difference to kick some families into a certain <laughs> decision to have a uh, second child. But they didn't stop there. Um, when we started to see those downturns in the numbers back in 2016, 2017, Putin responded almost immediately. So in 2017, they started adding to that maternity capital program that I've already, already described. They added to that with cash payments for first-time parents. So this is for your first baby, about $180 a month equivalent for 18 months, for the first 18 months of the child's life. Um, conveniently timed to start in January 2018, so conveniently timed for election purposes in, uh, in Russia. Um, and then this year, that maternity capital program, the one that's paid out for the second and subsequent children, they um, hiked up the amount for that, um, back up to the equivalent of about $10,000 again. In terms of overall health care spending, it's been pretty steady at somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% of GDP for the last 15 years. This is Russian government health spending as a percentage of GDP. So this doesn't count out-of-pocket spending. This doesn't count spending outside of formal public allocation. But this is pretty impressive. You know, they kept spending up at around 3% of GDP, even when GDP plummeted back in 2009 after the financial crisis. And as the country got richer, health spending tracked with that increased GDP so that they've kept with this as, you know, I'd say sort of a, you know, medium level priority um, for a very long time. Um, not a level of spending that would convince you that this is a high priority, not a level of spending that would track with what we see for health spending in other advanced industrial societies, um, but, but at least it's, it's something, you know, it's, it's, uh, it hasn't gone down over this uh, time period. So that's all the good news. Now let's talk about the challenges. Bloomberg does a healthcare efficiency index that rates the bang for the buck that you get with healthcare spending. Basically compares what you spend on healthcare to what your health outcomes look like in your country for 55 countries around the world. Russia comes in dead last in those 55 countries. We'll also note parenthetically that the United States comes in 53rd out of those 55 countries, so Russia is not, not alone. Um, so corruption is obviously part of this, and we'll land on corruption a little bit in, in a few minutes, but there's more to it than that. This isn't just because of Russia being, I think, appropriately called a, a kleptocracy. Um, there are also legal but perverse structural incentives throughout Russia's healthcare system. They're not allocating the scarce resources that they have for healthcare efficiently. 
basically they're still operating too much according to the old Soviet system where you just paid people for the amount of stuff that they did without a focus on what the outcomes of those efforts were. So they're spending too much on hospitals. They're spending too much on inpatient care and they have too many doctors. And they don't have enough primary care, they don't have enough general practice physicians, and they don't have enough public health. They don't have enough preventive, effective preventive work. So the Soviet model paid doctors, primary care doctors, therapists in clinics on the street. They were paid, reimbursed, according to how many people walked through the door. It didn't matter what happened after those people walked through the door. It was just sheer volume of patients. So the only incentive that those primary care doctors had was maybe to sign the sickness certificate that got you off from work, but mostly the incentive was just to get you out of the way so that you could get the next person in the door and they'd refer you up for specialist care. Specialists in hospitals were paid according to how many people they had in beds every night. So what's the incentive there? The incentive there is to cram your facilities with as many beds as you can and keep people in them for long as you can, as long as you can. So the Soviet Union had one of the highest average lengths of hospital stays anywhere in the world. That was true all over the, uh, all over the socialist space. So if you were going to have surgery, you'd be admitted to the hospital a couple weeks ahead of time for your blood work and for you know, a handful of, of tests. And then you were kept for a long time afterwards, much longer than we would here in our much more efficient um, Western system of health care. Now, it's not as bad as it used to be. That compulsory health insurance mechanism that I talked about before does put in place, or is supposed to put in place, is designed to put in place some incentives to curb those old Soviet habits. It's designed to have competition between insurance companies, competition between hospitals, competition between clinics. It's designed to change financing models toward capitation, um, toward diagnosis-related groups for hospitals, if you're familiar with, with those terms. The idea being that you shift the balance of hospital versus primary care from its current balance, which is about 60% of spending on hospital care and 40% on everything else, it's designed to flip that so that you spend about 60% on primary care, which is supposed to treat people much more cost effectively and, and much more effectively in terms of health outcomes, um, and then spend the rest on, on hospitals and, uh, and other parts of the system. So Russia knows this. And so there have been movements over the last decade or so to build up primary care, which was done with those old um, national health projects back in 2008, uh, the late 2000s, and to rationalize the hospital network. So all of the Western-trained Russian health economists at places like the Higher School of Economics who are doing very good work and very important work from a health economics efficiency perspective are saying you need to close a lot of these hospitals. You need to downsize them. You need to merge a lot of them in the rural areas. You need to get rid a lot of a lot of this wasteful excess hospital capacity and get these people into primary care instead. This makes sense. This sort of thing has been done with greater or lesser success all over the post-Soviet region and, and in Eastern and Central Europe, all the places that operated according to that old Soviet model of healthcare. Um, the idea is that you might merge and close a bunch of rural hospitals, but you'd make sure that everybody living out in the middle of nowhere still has, a has access to some sort of health care. You'd make sure there are transportation networks in place. You'd make sure that everyone is within um, a reasonable distance of a health care facility. Some countries have done this right. Ukraine right now is going through an extensive hospital map hospital master planning exercise with the goal of making sure that they can achieve those efficiencies that we've talked about, but that no one lives more than an hour away from a hospital. So it can be done. Oops. Ah, where's my picture? There we go. That's not how they're doing it in Russia. Um, basically, they've done what's, a deputy prime minister in Russia has referred to as thoughtless optimization of their healthcare facilities. Between 2000 and 2015, they've cut the number of hospitals in the country in half from about 11,000 to about 5,500. Bed capacity, mainly in these small rural hospitals out in the middle of nowhere, has decreased by over 25%. Out of 130,000 small rural settlements in the country, 
now only about 45,000 have any kind of health service at all. About 30,000 of these facility or of these settlements have 10 or fewer residents. This is a huge challenge. How do you get health care <coughs> out into the middle of nowhere where very few people live in these depopulating rural parts of the world? It's a big problem, and Russia has addressed it very politically, uh, ham handedly. The facilities that remain, especially in rural areas, have outdated equipment, low staffing, irregular supplies of drugs and other equipment. Um, they've tried mobile medical units to get care out to the people in these villages, but they don't have enough vehicles, they don't have enough trained personnel to staff them. Um, this is a far cry from the genuine universal access to care that existed in the Soviet period. Um, Soviet medicine didn't necessarily have a lot to brag about, but that universal access to at least some level of care was quite an accomplishment, and that has not just been eroded, that's really been destroyed in the, uh, in the last 25 years. The big political mistake was not beefing up primary care enough to compensate so that people don't have anywhere else to go. They don't have primary care providers to make up for the hospitals that have closed. They didn't sequence this right. They didn't build up the primary care before they started closing the hospitals. So what's happening is that the workloads for the primary care doctors who do exist have been increased dramatically. Pay rates are still set locally. And so pay is lousy in all of these rural facilities. So if you're a doctor, you're heading off to a city somewhere. You're not staying out in the uh, countryside. Doctors are legally required to keep working. They're not allowed to go completely on strike. So that they're doing something called work to, work to rule strikes, which means they work only the bare minimum necessary under their contracts and no more. Um, and that's what leads to things like the protests that we've seen. Um, in lots of places around the country. Um, this is a photo that was taken in Moscow back in 2014, 2015, when some of these uh, hospital downsizing reforms uh, first started. Alcohol is still a big problem. Um, there's been a huge cultural shift in urban areas over the last decade. Definitely the alcohol numbers are down. That's contributed hugely to the declining mortality in the country, but men are still drinking. Um, primarily in rural areas. As taxes on alcohol have increased with the new regulations and new legislation around alcohol and tobacco, um, vodka is less cheap and less readily available than it used to be, and so people are consuming surrogate alcohol, um, non-beverage alcohol, think cough syrup, um, industrial lubricants, um, and they're making their own. And so you hear story after story of these villages with fewer than 10 people out in the middle of nowhere, rural areas. A lot of them are babushkas, old Russian women, who are making a living by producing bootleg semagon um, alcohol and selling it to, uh, to neighboring villages. Um, and this has come up over and over again. There was a Federation Council roundtable on social policy last year that said right now Russian men outside prison have higher mortality rates, they're more likely to die prematurely than Russian men inside prison because of alcohol consumption. Um, and in fact, some Russian demographers argue that those improvements in life expectancy that we saw a few slides ago over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, those life expectancy gains are largely due to improvements in infant mortality not working age adult male mortality, that we still have a working age male mortality crisis, largely driven by alcohol consumption and again, largely in rural areas. Um, there are also counterproductive policies in place related to the inherent conservatism in the kind of Russia that Putin is trying to build. And a handful of different uh, issues fall under this umbrella. One is abortion and increasing uh, restrictions on access to abortion and an increasing move toward a pro-life culture. Um, even though abortion is increasingly rare in Russia, abortion rates are about a third of what they were back in the Soviet period, so that abortion is not in any way responsible for the demographic collapse that we saw in the country in the, uh, in the 1990s. Um, but uh, what they're doing now is just closing off women's access to good reproductive health care that's going to have a negative impact on, on women's health um, over time. Um, also under uh, this rubric of increased conservatism in society, they also have incredibly harsh attitudes toward drug users. And injection drug use is what's driving Russia's HIV epidemic, which is of huge concern. Everywhere else in the world, 
HIV epidemics are being brought under control. Um, Russia's and Ukraine's, um, the Europe and Central Asia region is the only part of the world where HIV is still increasing. And it's largely because Russia insists on treating injection drug use as a criminal justice issue rather than a public health issue. So Russia is stubbornly adherent to its ban on methadone or any kind of substitution therapy, and not an outright ban, but a huge number of restrictions on needle and syringe exchange. So they're dooming themselves to an ongoing HIV epidemic because of their adherence to these conservative, uh, conservative policies. Um, it's gotten to the point where people are afraid to speak out about anything that doesn't adhere to these conservative policies. So this is from Twitter just a couple of days ago. A uh, very popular um, TV personality has been, has been proposed in the Duma to fine her. They won't actually do this, but threatened her with a pretty significant fine just because she's saying, you know, I don't think increasing the payments that you make to people to have babies are going to reverse Russia's demographic problems. So that conservative extends to, to a control, to a stifling of free debate about what can actually be done to uh, to address these issues. There's also a problem with exposure to modern science. As Russia has closed itself off under the last two Putin terms, um, international scientific exchange, the ability of people in the academic community in the West to engage with Russian scientists has been forced into increasingly narrow and monitored lanes. Um, there's still some activity with the Fogarty Center at uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, that's diminished over the last couple of years, and it's largely focused on HIV and tuberculosis rather than on the non-communicable diseases that are the primary drivers of Russian mortality. Um, you know, this is part of this move toward Russia's conservative great power status, its counter-positioning to the West in global politics. You know, a statement that our Russian scientific traditions are world-class and we don't need the West. We don't need cooperation with the West. We don't need to adopt Western or international standards of scientific inquiry. And that has translated into increasingly tight control over their academics, over their scholars, uh, in terms of whom they can meet with, uh, what kinds of reporting they have to do on their contacts with foreigners, um, the equipment and the biological specimens that they're allowed uh, into the country and out of the country. So it, it's really cast a, a shadow over the international scientific collaboration and medical collaboration that's available to Russia. Another avenue of, of challenge to Russia's health and demographic issues is the pharmaceutical industry and import substitution. So this has been a huge push for the last seven or eight years. Uh, international drug companies who want to get into this large, increasingly middle-class market have been told they can only have access to that market if they play along with Putin's import substitution drive. And this isn't just pharma, right? This is um, you know, across the Russian industrial landscape, um, especially since the sanctions. But there's huge pressure now to replace imported meds with Russian alternatives. And that's fine for the development of Russian industry, but what that's meaning in the short and probably the medium term is incredibly reduced availability of a lot of very important medicines because Russian industry just isn't capable of right now of replacing what's been available from the West. Um, and it's dangerous to try to get around the system. Um, there was an NGO back in Saratov in 2018 that supports diabetics. In, the, in that part of the country. And it was declared a foreign agent because it was working with the Moscow offices of two international drug companies to try to get insulin for their people. So again, all of, all of these things come together. Um, another issue has to do with target setting. And target setting, like we saw in the May decrees, is great. But in order to have meaningful targets and to progress toward those targets in a meaningful way, you need good data. And it's not clear that that's the case in Russia. Um, lower level health officers, clinics, hospitals, 
health administrators have plenty of incentive to falsify data, to fudge data, in order to make it look like they're meeting the targets that have been sent for them. <coughs> it's not just that. There's also a lack of administrative capacity. The system just isn't yet well digitized. There's too much paper record keeping. Um, so some of it is capacity issues, but a lot of it is just that they're fudging the numbers in order to make it look like they're meeting the targets. So the most obvious example of this over the last couple of years has been that the May decrees um, back in 2012 set mortality from tuberculosis as a big target. And so all of a sudden we saw declines in reported mortality from tuberculosis and increases in reported mortality from HIV AIDS. Well, if you're HIV positive, the disease you're most likely to actually die from in Russia is tuberculosis. And when you die, um, there are standards for how you should code that cause of death, but if you have an incentive from levels above you to code that death as from HIV rather than tuberculosis, that's most definitely what you're going to do. And we see example after example of coding of uh, both morbidity and mortality shifting in order to make it look like they're achieving those, uh, those targets in some meaningful way. So the broad conclusion here is that Again, as we said earlier, this demographic decline in Russia to a certain extent is locked in. Again, the echo of the lower numbers of children who were born back in the early and mid 1990s. That's unlikely to be reversed. And so, a couple of questions here. One is, is it really important that you have fewer people? Is it really important to have more people? How important is that number of your overall population? If your economy that's based primarily on natural resource extraction, how many workers do you really need to make that happen? If your economy that, an economy that is trying to progress into a modern 21st century technologically oriented service economy, again, how many people do you need to do that, right? You don't necessarily need you know, a China model millions of workers to go staff your production lines in factories. So, Maybe Russia needs to focus not so much on the number of people it has, but on the quality of the human capital that's represented in those population numbers. And this is important not just for the health of that population, which is what we've been talking about for the last half hour, but it's also important in terms of human capital more broadly defined. And I'd argue that here's what Russia needs to do if it wants to solve its demographic challenges. It needs to think about what it wants those people to do and broaden its conception of human capital to include education, training, skills, the tools that the people it has needs to contribute to whatever trajectory its economy is going to take in the coming decades. So are there currently, for example, providing middle-aged and older Russians with opportunities for mid-career training that might let them stay in the workforce longer, be less of a pension burden, contribute to economic development, keep their skills relevant? Is there any of that going on? No. Is there any of the kind of vocational technical education going on that will capture people who don't go to the university but instead train them to be plumbers, machine tool operators, you know, the kind of people who know how to fix stuff when it breaks. Is Russia training large numbers of those people? No. So it appears that there's a dramatic mismatch between the kinds of skills development that's happening in Russia's education and training sector and the kind of people that they need if they want to focus on deep development of their human capital moving forward. And so I'll close by talking about just two major factors that play into this. One is going back to education and science. Um, higher education, the Academy of Sciences have been mired in controversy um, for years, but we've especially heard about it over the uh, over the last few weeks uh, with the big report about uh, hundreds of academic studies in Russia now being removed from the Russian um, uh, Academy archives because they were proved to have been fraudulent or falsified in some way. Um, you know, Russian scientists are increasingly being forced to report to the FSB about their contacts with foreign scientists. Universities are being pressured actually to increase their international rankings and there are some facilities in place to try to attract international scholars to come work in Russia, contribute to Russian labs, you know, build a Russian scientific engineering technical base but there's still a conservative old guard in charge at the Academy of Sciences. And they still wanna do science their way, which is not following accepted scientific method. It's not to the standards of international peer reviewed scientific literature. Um, 
they're increasing the pressure on young Russian scholars who would very much like to collaborate with the West, who would very much like to publish in that international peer-reviewed literature, and instead they're putting pressure on them to publish in Russian journals rather than the internationally accepted Western journals. And in terms of medical research and, and medical practice, in medicine, low pay for doctors means that there are very few at least monetary incentives for the best and the brightest to go into a medical career in Russia. And there's still no tradition of evidence-based medicine. That has not caught hold in Russia. So if you're a scientist, if you're someone who wants to think scientifically, medicine is not the place that you can apply that in, uh, in Russia. As a result, brain drain is a huge problem for the Russian economy, and it has been for, uh, for five, six, seven years. Now, it's important first to point out that the vast majority of migration into and out of Russia is still unskilled labor migration from Central Asia and the Caucasus. So we're not talking about millions of people when we talk about brain drain. We're talking about numbers in the tens of thousands, you know, maybe one or 200,000 at its peak. But it's not so much how many people are leaving Russia, it's who they are. What we've seen, especially since you know, the failed protests at Bolotnia back in 2011, 2012, and then Putin coming in for the third term and, and the sanctions and everything that's happened since then. Um, Well-educated, skilled, technologically sophisticated people, the creative class in Russia are leaving, either to find better economic opportunity elsewhere or to find a better political environment, to get out from under the shadow of an authoritarian political system. So if you want a modern economy, if you want to diversify beyond natural resource extraction, the people who are leaving are exactly the people that you need to stay home. You know, they're the scientists, they're the engineers, they're the entrepreneurs. It's hard to get a handle on exactly how many of them there are because most of these people aren't turning in their passports and saying, we're out of here as they walk out the door. They're keeping some ties to Russia. Some of them are keeping an apartment. Most of them are sending remittances back. Some of them still have workforce ties to Russia in some way. But you can look at the immigration statistics in receiving countries, the places where these people are going. You can look at things like private school enrollments and uh, talk to realtors and find out where these uh, where these well-educated entrepreneurial Russians are ending up. Um, you know, in London, for example, if you look at the real estate market in, in London, and in London, and it's no longer just the billionaires buying up all of the nice property in a couple of neighborhoods. Um, it's people with maybe a quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars to invest in starting a small or medium-sized business somewhere. So this is the entrepreneurial energy that Russia needs to keep. And instead, you have polls like one that was just released a, a month ago um, saying more than half of Russians age 18 to 24 say they want to leave. More than half. That's up from only 20% back in 2014. <coughs> it's a huge change in just a couple of years. Among 25 to 29 year olds, 30% want to leave. So this is your young energy that, that's, that says it wants a way out, that's looking for the, uh, for the exit door. So the bottom line, again, just to restate the, the main point again, um, and I, I can't resist doing this. If you go back to the slide that talks about all the things that Russia's doing to, uh, to move in the opposite direction of where they need to go with its human capital, um, you know, if you, weren't, if you didn't know what country we were talking about, a lot of that describes the United States right now as well. But, um, but there are more foundational structural issues going on in Russia that we don't have here, right? They're wrapped up in a political system that prioritizes control and conservative values over science, over evidence-based practice, over free inquiry, and over the free exercise of initiative. And as a result, these human capital issues are very likely to be a continued constraint on Russia's growth and development. Great. Thank right you very there. much. Thank you. So we have about half an hour. We have about. I'm too loud now. Have about half an hour for um, questions, um, and um, I can open them up. Or yes, Norman Neymar, and please introduce yourselves to Judy as you. Um, uh, so I'm Norman Neymar. I'm in the history department here at the UHC South as a fellow. <coughs> you, did, you just ended with uh, saying these will have very serious effects on, you know, the social and economic development of Russia. Mm -hmm. 
Look, how do you measure or how do you think about the political effects? In other words, is all of this undermining um, Putin's um, legitimacy? Is it affecting his opinion polls? Is there, way, is there a way to sort of gauge how these particular kinds of issues um, impact or will have an impact on, uh, on Putin's political regime? Mm -hmm. Tough question. The, the opinion polls aren't moving in his direction over the last couple of years. That's clearly something he's nervous about, but it's unclear how much of that we can attribute to these specific kinds of human capital concerns. Um, I will note, though, that the new government that's just been put in place is led by a new prime minister who is talking now very explicitly about wanting to bring in evidence-based policy and evidence-based practice. You know, he's coming from a technocratic tradition that seems to be responsive to exactly the kinds of concerns that we're talking about here. So a possible signal that they're seeing the handwriting on the wall. Um, a corollary to that is that much of what we're talking about here is just about wasted resources. It's about efficiency. And that also has to be something the Kremlin is considering, is that they need to figure out in an era of scarce resources, how can they get more bang for the ruble in in making health education and everything else move forward. And you could, couldn't you argue that the, um, the, the young, younger people out on the streets are complaining in part about the education system and sort of lack of access to jobs they want after even going through training that's supposed to be, you know, more relevant to the modern workforce? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, Doug, in the back, can you introduce yourself? Sure, Doug Owens, I'm from the Center for Health Policy here at FSI. And a real live medical doctor, sure, Judy. Sure. Yeah. Don't hold it against me. I play one on TV. Um, I did work in St. Petersburg back in the early 2000s on mm -hmm. HIV, and sad, it sounds like their policies towards HIV have not really no. changed. Uh, they were, you know, doing things that we knew were absolutely due to failure back then, the criminalization of injection drug use, which was really driving their whole HIV <coughs> So my question is, like, why would evidence-based medicine in general be seen as a threat? Uh, that, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand that. It's, it's not so much that evidence-based medicine is seen as a threat. It's just counter to Russian tradition, which views medicine as an art rather than as a science. And it's pushing up, bringing in traditions of evidence-based medicine is pushing up against the, the rule of that old guard in the Academy of Sciences and at a lot of universities. It, who among us who's been to Russia has been advised to have honey when they've been feeling really bad? Yes. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. Introduce yourself. I'm Regina Kasper from the medical school. You have actually talked a little, and maybe this was not the, uh, the purpose of your, uh, of your talk, about the quality and whether people trust the system and whether there is a two-tier system which we have also developed in this country and in many European countries, where, you know, the well-to-do manage to get a good doctor uh, mm -hmm. and pay for that doctor, and how much that actually creates tensions uh, within the system. Mm -hmm. And in Russia, it's actually a three-tiered system of access to health care. I haven't talked at all today about the private provision of medical care, but there is an enormous network now of private hospitals and clinics, and if you can afford to pay out of pocket and go into those, you can afford what is now a world-class standard of care. Mm -hmm. Then there's the public you know, government-run health system that's covered by that compulsory medical insurance in the larger cities. And you can do pretty well by accessing those facilities. So if you live in one of the urban areas, not just Moscow and St. Petersburg, but to their credit, in you know, a couple of dozen other um, good-sized cities around the country, you can get pretty decent care. So it's, an, it's a rich versus poor divide, and it's a rural versus urban divide now as well. Can you talk a bit about corruption as well in the... Uh... In, in the public system, you mentioned you were going to, and I'll, I noted the others, yep. Yeah, sure, it's enormous and it happens at, a, at many different levels. So at the highest level, it's people in the Ministry of Health and their families benefiting through uh, corruption in public procurement, you know, kickbacks on import and manufacturing of medicines and medical equipment and recommending that drugs go on the essential medicines list that just happen to be produced by companies with connections to uh, to people in the health ministry and, and other federal and, and regional agencies. Um, then there's 
sort of political corruption at the local level that ends up translating into incredibly wasteful spending so that you'll have um, small you know, neighborhoods or, or rural areas where neighboring regions will each buy expensive, you know, MRI or other equipment when just one would do for a very large geographic area, but the politicians are benefiting again from kickbacks on the public procurement of those, uh, of those pieces of equipment, even though they're not training people to use the equipment, they're not buying the consumables that are needed to continue to operate the equipment. We've actually had cases um, you know, over the last 20 years of Western medical equipment manufacturers pulling out of the Russian market because they don't want to bear the reputational risk that goes along with having their equipment being used so poorly in, uh, in Russian clinical settings. Um, and then you have individual level corruption. And this goes back to the Soviet days when you would never think of going to a doctor without bringing some kind of um, usually a gift rather than a bribe because a monetary bribe was illegal and could get you into a lot of trouble, but taking a gift to your doctor was not illegal and came to be expected after a while. Um, and you could buy your way to the top of a queue. You could buy more attention from a physician or from uh, you know, attending nurses or, or staff by, by bringing some kind of, uh, of goodies to the people who were attending. When the Soviet Union collapsed, that turned into sheer money. Um, and so lots of under the table payments, still out of pocket payments in order to get beneficial treatment. Although I have to say that for the last, you know, 10 years or so, really since the National Health Project started back in 2006, we've seen a diminishing of that. Again, in the major cities, um, there's enough money in the system now and the money that's been put into the system has been effective enough that you can get pretty decent care without necessarily having to buy your way into it. So that this isn't so much corruption anymore, but about social practices in healthcare. Now you would never, uh, you wouldn't necessarily expect to pay a bribe walking in the door anymore, but you would never think of going to a doctor that you didn't have a personal connection to somehow. That it's, it's social networks that matter now to get the trust and, and confidence that you'll get this doctor's attention and best effort at the end of the line. So it might be that you're going to your, you know, brother's girlfriend's hairdresser's bowling league team member, right? You know, it might be a long chain of connections that get you that, uh, that connection to the doctor, but you would never think of going to a doctor without setting that up somehow. This too reminds me of the United States, but anyway, yes. <laughs> uh, Steve. Yes, uh, Steve Piper, uh, we're here over here at CSAC. Um, you talked about the creative class, the entrepreneurial community. Uh, and over 20 years, well, I think we've seen Putin limit political space with, with Russia. They really haven't touched the ability to read unless you're involved in security services. Has there been any kind of discussion in Russia about basically saying, no, we're not going to let you read. We're not going to give you that exit tax book. You have to stay here. I haven't heard that. No other than government officials who are being told you've got to bring your money back, which in a lot of cases translates into you have to bring your family back, even though you had sent them to London to live and go to school. So he's exercising those levels of control over his employees, but I haven't heard anything yet that extends beyond that out into the private sector and broader society. Uh, gentleman at the end of the table. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you about Russia's immigration policy in terms of the need for people. Low birth rate is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me immigration would be a natural approach to having more population. They're, they're out there in the Middle East, even in Africa. So what are they going to look at that point of view? Mm -hmm. And they have millions of labor migrants, both legal and documented and undocumented and illegally living and working in Russia from Central Asia primarily and to a lesser extent from the, uh, from the Caucasus. So there are many parallels between the immigration situation in Russia and the immigration situation in the United States. The immigrants are necessary to do the jobs that Russians aren't willing to do. And there are millions of them forming a backbone of the economy in primarily the construction industry, food service, and a lot of other industries. Um, there's a huge amount of racism and racially tinged resentment against these migrants. Um, 
I look at it just in sort of, you know, my little public health world of infectious disease, the line in, you know, general Russian conversation is that these dirty migrants are bringing infectious disease into our country, when in fact there's plenty of research that shows that it's exactly the other way around, that they come into the country relatively healthy. You know, you got to be rel relatively healthy if you're going to do labor migration. You have to be able to get to where you're going and offer something to the, uh, to the labor force. So these young men are coming into the country they're picking up HIV, TB, hepatitis, other infectious diseases while they're in Russia and taking them back home. So lots of racism, lots of political controversy, lots of sensationalist journalism about these migrants. And yet it's a tightrope that has to be walked in the political sphere with these people because your economy can't live without them. The other big factor in Russia that differentiates the Russia situation from the American situation is that all those labor migrants from Central Asia are Muslim. And so there's a huge security terrorism dimension that gets added to the, uh, added to the, whole, the whole question. Can I just add one, one footnote? That, um, there's also, to be fair, that, isn't it true that not that many people want to go there? who are not coming from Central Asia, because it's not very friendly to, oh, yeah. I mean, the yes. language is hard to learn. Mm -hmm. It's not like something else, you know, you would know. Um, and there isn't, you know, a resettlement program that's going to help you. Um, so, you know, that's a policy issue, right? The other is, um, what there are Chinese immigrants, but again, there's the mm -hmm. racist racism mm -hmm. issue. So it's not necessarily... Immigration, even though, as you mentioned, there's like a positive, uh, like about 200,000 a year, right? It's not the quote unquote desirable immigrants necessarily from the Russian government perspective uh, who have, you know, skills or who are going to, you, know, you wouldn't have the same immigrant story um, that you might have here. Mm -hmm. That's wouldn't you agree? Would you agree with that? I, absolutely. And I just add to that, that the government for over a decade has put in place a handful of different programs to try to lure the right kind of immigrants to come in. Um, pretty significant financial incentives to scientists and engineers, academics, to come in, um, you know, Russians who have left or non-Russians, you know, just anybody who wants to come and set up a lab in, you know, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk. Um, there have been some pretty attractive packages put together to create um, the incentives to do that. Um, China's done the same kind of thing and it's worked, right? So you have all kinds of Chinese um, scientists who now have you know, a lab in Shanghai, a lab in Austin. They live half a year in one place and a half a year in the other. Um, Russia's found almost no one to take the bait on that. It's a very different set of conditions, um, not only in terms of broader society, but in terms of the scientific environment that you find yourself and in. Even Syrians, they have not taken very many Syrian refugees, right. like yeah. maybe under 100. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, they have taken Ukrainians more recently. Yes. Yeah. yeah they yeah. have taken the Ukrainians. Yep. Um, okay. I see you. Uh, but this gentleman was in line first. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your talk. My name is uh, Gorsi. I'm a member of the community. Um, I think at the beginning of your slide, you had a uh, construct that said uh, many of the initiatives that they have is not working. And it implied that it's not working because they are counter to practices in the West. I think some Western values and models that they said they're not adopting and therefore it's not working. My question is, to what extent do you think isolating Russia and making it feel under siege by the sanctions that are in place, and the um, uh, sort of competition that right now exists between the West and Russia that forces what you characterize here mm -hmm. on this slide as productive conservatism as opposed to productive conservatism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the effect of all of this really on the policies that they're adopting to address their issues. Because I would imagine that any country that is, feels under siege, its posture is going to be different mm -hmm. than if it felt integrated in the broader community of nations. Mm -hmm. So this is a tough, broader geopolitical question, right? And, and it's one that the Obama administration faced when it first came in. How do you deal with Russia? Um, is it counterproductive to isolate it and to drive it even further back into its conservative isolationist corner, or is it more productive to try to engage, to try to bring Russia into the family of nations, um, you know, 
we, we walked that tightrope. We, we tried to resolve that tension for, for a long time. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that Crimea is what kind of closed the door to that, the idea that I, our overtures are not working. Um, you know, that, that these are not, these are not um, actions that deserve to be rewarded. So th that's the call at this point. Um, when I talk about counterproductive actions that are anti-Western, I'm talking about not integrating into international communities of science. I'm talking about not adhering to evidence-based practice. Um, maybe Western isn't the right term label to put on those things. There are a few cases too, though. For example, you mentioned smoking and alcohol, where they, they have Mm -hmm. They seem to have followed, you know, World Health Organization recommendations, mm -hmm. and so it's not blanket. Right, and, and that, that's, a, that's a great point, Catherine, and let me take off on that for just a moment. Um, thinking just about the health sphere, what Russia has done with alcohol and tobacco has been absolutely in line with international best practice. Um, the World Health Organization has a treaty called the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. It's the first ever global public health treaty. Um, it's been around for about 15 years. Um, most countries in the world have signed and ratified it, and it's countries agreeing to adhere to those best practices on how you get people to smoke less. Um, Russia signed and ratified back in the late 2000s, yeah. Um, the United States signed it under the Clinton administration and has never ratified it because the Senate has to ratify treaties and the tobacco industry won't let the Senate ratify that treaty. That is a fact that the Russians love to bring up in global health fora. And in fact, if we look at the global health landscape, especially over the last few years, what we see is Russia working very hard um, I mean, to, to put it bluntly, to step into the vacuum that's been created by the Trump administration's retreat from leadership on global health. And so we see Russia in areas where it has made some progress, control of noncommunicable disease um, and tuberculosis. And we can talk a lot about TB in Russia, but they have done some things right. Um, we now see Russians in high global health leadership positions on noncommunicable disease and tuberculosis. And we see the Russian voice increasingly prominent in international discussions. You know, the WHO European Office on Noncommunicable Disease is in Moscow. It's being funded by Russia. Um, the, their voice is increasingly legitimate and increasingly matters on these issues. They're taking advantage of, of American retreat of American negligence of a lot of these issues in global health. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a couple of questions down there, and I know the gentleman up here. Yeah. Uh, I, it was very informative. Uh, I would like to go back to this gentleman's question. And when I was listening to you, I was thinking, how come that Putin doesn't take more uh, Syrian uh, in order to, because many of those families have many children, can boost the population and also show to the world that he is a very kind person and uh, taking care of refugees. Uh, do they do that? Why doesn't do that? Mm -hmm. I, as Catherine said, they've taken very few, and I agree, this would be a great act of political showmanship. But there is so much hostility among ethnic Russian populations to non-ethnic Russian populations that it would be a challenge to place many Syrian families as refugees in communities of ethnic Russians. So the logical place to put them would be in the Caucasus, right? In, in the regions of Russia that are predominantly ethnically non-Russian and are mostly Islamic. Um, Russia's terrified about the demographic imbalance between those non-Russian Muslim populations and its ethnic Slavs. The fertility rate differential between Russians and non-Russians is enormous. Um, and you know, Russia's looking over its shoulder at the implications of, of those differential demographics. You know, what happens over time when an increasing percentage of your conscript pool, for example, is non-ethnic Russian and Muslim? So I think they're concerned about the potential of you know, showcasing the Syrian refugees in those communities that are actually a cause of concern and potential instability for Russia. Um, can, can I just ask, can the 
pro do the propaganda and make people more kinder to the, for instance, Syrian, and then again by through brainwashing, hoping for the next generation that not be so Muslim kind of. Mm -hmm. So you would think that might be an effective strategy. And in fact, up until a couple of years ago, um, Putin's line on the relationship between the Russian and the non-Russian ethnicities in the country actually harked a lot back to the old Soviet line, which was, we are a successful melting pot. And Putin liked to say in speeches that Russia was a more successful melting pot experiment than the United States, that, you know, that Russian... Orthodox Christians live in harmony with the Islamic communities in the, who live in Russia, that Islam is as much a part of Russian tradition as the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, there, there was a lot of policy and an enormous amount of lip service paid to this idea that we're all going to live together in harmony. And starting around 2014, 2015, you started to see a shift in that rhetoric. And I think it's all part and parcel of this movement toward Russian nationalism, conservatism, that, that we've seen as a part of Putin's you know, sort of state building um, and, and great power status enhancement in the last couple of years, so that there has been a dramatic move toward emphasizing the country's Russianness. And it's caused quite a bit of tension with these non-Russian ethnicities. And the big sticking point just in the last couple of years has gone back to a speech that Putin made in early 2017 in Mariel, which is in um, a community up near Finland, a non-ethnic Russian community, um, where he said, look, the Russian language, because there are you know, well over 100 different languages spoken in, in Russia besides Russian, and they've always had equal status. And or 35 of them have had equal status. So there are 36 you know, national languages in, in Russia. And Putin said in this speech, we can't have this anymore, that we can't have 36 different languages being spoken, that the Russian language is an inherent part of the Russian national identity, that it's part of, of a core of what it means to be Russian and in Russia at this point in time. And so he set in motion a set of, of, of legislation that is being enforced that doesn't permit those ethnicities in the non-ethnic Russian republics to teach children in languages other than Russian anymore. And just about all of them had been doing at least the first couple of years of primary school, some of them all the way through high school, um, instruction was in their ethnic language in addition to being in Russian. And now that is no longer legal. And it was enforced. Back in 2018, they started sending um, monitors from the federal government out into the regions to patrol the schools to see what language instruction was taking place in. And they were firing teachers on the spot when they found that instruction was taking place in one of the non-Russian languages. So that is, this has set off quite a few protests around the country. This is a real potential flashpoint of instability that you, know, you can be sure the Kremlin is monitoring quite closely, but so far they're sticking to the line of the Russian language and Russian ethnicity being at the core of this you know, Russian national project. Okay, so I, I'm just going to collect the last two questions um, and then have you answer uh, in one fell swoop, so we end, end on time. Yes. I'm Cheryl Gold. I'm a primary care physician. And I was just wondering, um, are there electronic medical records mm -hmm. being used currently? You know, we've been very slow to pick up on that in our own country, mm -hmm. but now it's become pretty standard, and there are you know, the big data associated with having, especially one single electronic medical record can be very important for policy and uh, health policy. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what the status is there. Mm -hmm. That's an easy one to do quickly. Yeah. Um, yes, in the urban areas, no, in the rural areas. Yeah. Right. And, and impressively in the urban areas. You know, they, they've, they've done a leapfrog of technology. The, the degree to which not just the health sector, but public administration as a whole has digitized. You, know, you, can, do, you can do everything on an app now. Yeah. You can no negotiate your way around the Moscow Metro now on an app. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yes. Two. One is great talk. My appetite is whetted. Where do I go to next? Your website, your book, or your email. Second thing, which is more detailed, 
you say we in the United States will not sign these treaties. Are we not following reasonable practices or have we just decided we want our people, we don't care about the health of our people? Mm -hmm. If you can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm happy to follow up if you'd like to talk more about these issues um, later. In terms of American practice, um, Tobacco taxation, tobacco control measures are hugely variable at the state level in the United States. So you'll pay something very different for tobacco, for a pack of cigarettes in New York than you would in you know, Alabama. That's why there's so much illegal cigarette trafficking in, in the United States. It's because of state differentials in taxes. And time and time again, the international research shows us that the number one most important thing you can do to get someone to stop smoking, or more importantly, to keep them from start smoking when they're a young person is make it more expensive for them to do that. So that's the important uh, thing. Um, yeah, I mean, on a national level, you know, the Senate doesn't ratify that treaty because the tobacco industry doesn't want to let the United States make that kind of statement. Um, it, it's as much a symbolic thing as it is a meaningful thing in terms of the legislation. There's a book you should look at, uh, The History of the Cigarette by Sarah Miloff, which has just come out. It's on in Amazon. It's on Amazon. M I L O V. It's even you can even listen audibly. Yeah. That's what I've been doing when I was sick with the flu. It made me feel great. Um, the the other dif the other difference is you know the Russia doesn't have available to it for tobacco control some of the things that we do. So well we may all want to go negative on the Senate, especially right now. Um, that's fine. <laughs> you can do that, but you you can't in Russia yet. sue someone if you can tie their debt to just, you know, yeah. in, in the United States. You can't do that uh, in Russia. So anyway, that's another, yeah. Um, all right. Um, Judy, thank you so much. You can tell by the fact that there's so many people are still in the room um, that it was, it was a really riveting talk. So now hopefully you guys know why I think your research and work is just fascinating. 